Good morning again. This is Western Civ 1, Lecture 4. Western Civ 1 for ninth grade, Lecture 4. So in the last lecture, I, I focused mostly on the Visigoths, but they were an example of the Germanic barbarians who came inside and settled within the, the Roman world. And I finished that lecture by talking about Romanization, the process of becoming Roman. So what did it mean to be a Roman by the 400s AD? Well, you've got to remember the Roman Empire now stretches from what is now Portugal uh, in the west to the border of Scotland in the north, uh, through Romania in the northeast, uh, through the deserts of Syria in the Middle East, what we call the Middle East in America today, down to the southern borders of Egypt, and right across to what's now today Morocco. So it completely surrounded the Mediterranean world and extended into parts of what's today Germany and almost all of Austria uh, and Switzerland. Uh, the southern portion of Holland uh, was also part of the Roman world, okay? So uh, the uh, uh, Roman world was very big. Oh, and I can't forget the province of Britannia was the whole of what is now England and Wales on the island of Great Britain. They never got to Ireland, and they never invaded the Picts of what's now Scotland, the Picts, P-I-C-T-S, in the north of Scotland, very wild people. They stripped themselves naked and painted themselves blue when they went into battle, and I think they scared even the Romans. <laughs> but, but all of what's now England and Wales was part of the Roman Empire, stretching from southern Holland down to western Germany, north of the Alps, went up and included what's now Romania, down to the Black Sea, the whole eastern uh, shore of the Mediterranean and what's now the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, all of Egypt, right across the, the northern strip of Africa, all the way to Morocco. Um, all of that was the Roman world. It was divided east and west linguistically. If you take a line and draw it right next to the heel of the boot of Italy, north-south, so the whole of Italy is west of the line and everything uh, east of that line. The eastern portion was where the Greek language was the common tongue. Uh, and the, uh, the line west, uh, that line west that includes all of Italy and what's now France and Spain and Portugal and, uh, and uh, Great Britain. All of that was Latin was the common tongue the Latin-speaking West, the Greek-speaking East. So what did it mean to be a Roman? Well, it did mean you owned a heritage that stretched back to the city of Rome. Uh, people in the East who spoke Greek, most of them never learned to speak Latin. People in the West, most of them never learned to speak Greek. So there wasn't a common tongue that everybody in the Roman world shared. Educated people in the West, the elites, the people who could afford, you know, to invest years in their children's education, which wasn't everybody. There were no public schools in ancient uh, Rome. Everybody was tutored by a private tutor or went to a private school. Um, and so if you couldn't afford to pay for that, your kids just didn't get uh, an education. But in the West, people who could afford to have their kids educated often paid a little extra so they could gain at least basic Greek because the Romans did deeply respect the intellectual heritage and the artistic heritage of ancient Greece. So it's through the Romans that the Western world really got the Greeks. Uh, the fact that we read Plato and Aristotle and admire the Parthenon and all that, we do that in the Western world because the Romans did that. They admired all that stuff. Uh, and uh, they wanted their kids, the, least, the wealthy elites wanted their kids, not only to be highly proficient in Latin, but to, to have a smattering of Greek language and culture, at least, if not true expertise, and some did. Not quite the same degree of respect for the cultural achievements of Rome in the Greek-speaking world. Everybody admired their engineering, though. Nobody could deny the Romans were top flight engineers, architects, and the legal system the Romans created was admired 
by everybody who ever knew about it. I mean, really a remarkable achievement. The, the law that we uh, have today, our, our very word legal comes from the Roman word for law, which says a lot, doesn't it? Um, so uh, that's the broad cultural picture. So, but what does it mean to be a Roman in the 400s AD? Half the people don't speak Latin in the Roman world. Uh, travel was not what it used to be. In the 150s AD, the Roman highway system, and you've all seen that map in my classroom with the highways labeled on it, the Roman highway system was superb. There wasn't a country on earth that had a highway system like that until the late 1800s or even 1900s again. I mean, the Roman at the height of the empire in the around 150 AD, per magnificent roads spanning the whole empire. It was, and law and order was pretty well maintained, at least on dry land. Sometimes piracy could be a problem on the Mediterranean, but on dry land, their law and order was probably on the order of our law and order today. The Roman army kept law and order on those roads, and they did a good job of it. So it was possible at the height of the Roman Empire, 150, to travel all over the empire. There, there are people who we know from their gravestones, they bragged about where they went. One uh, merchant from what's now Turkey brags on his tombstone about having visited 53 uh, provinces and sub-provinces, all the way to Britannia. Uh, now, he was probably a little unusual. Uh, you won't brag about all that on your tombstone unless you were really proud of doing something unusual. But, but still, people did travel uh, in, the, in, the, in the Roman Empire at the height of its success. Uh, pretty, pretty comfortably, pretty easily over distance. Um, uh, you know, they're probably walking. <laughs> they might be on a donkey or something. So it wouldn't maybe please us as comfortable, but uh, uh, compared to the rest of the human history until modern times, that was probably the safest long distance travel you could do in the Roman Empire of 150 AD. But then, you remember, we talked about the time of troubles, that 60-year period or 55-year period in the middle of the 3rd century, the mid-200s AD. The time of troubles, the military anarchy was a chaos. Civil war after civil war, uh, barbarian invasions, war with Palmyra, uh, emperor after emperor after emperor, murdered in his sleep, uh, killed on the battlefield, poisoned. Uh, what a mess. And you can imagine that Civic order fell to pieces around the empire in that long period, terrible period. Uh, now, so long distance travel dies off. Diocletian in the 280s, remember 280s and 290s, he, he puts the empire back together, creates the Tetrarchy. Uh, Constantine and his sons will inherit that in the first half of the 300s. Uh, some order is restored. You do have, um, you know, Long-distance trade somewhat revived, but it's never the same as it was. And by the 400s, with the Germanic invasions wrecking havoc, long-distance trade has really, really dropped off. So the Roman world by the 400s was becoming a more provincial world. Um, the cities more and more are hollowing out, emptying out. Uh, there's still administrative centers for the Roman government, such as it is. But then when the Germans come in and start settling, they're given control over the regions where they settle in a lot of stuff. So even going to the provincial capital may not be what it used to be. You're probably going to the villa of a Germanic chieftain now if you live in one of those regions. And slowly over the early 400s, the cities of the Roman Empire in the West start to die. More and more, the people who matter are the rich people in the villa on the hill up above you. They're the ones who dominate your life, uh, not the official governor in the provincial, provincial capital 100 miles away. So the Roman Western world starts to become more insular, more focused on the locality, the province, and then the locality within the province. The central government becomes less and less important. Yes, the commander-in-chief of the army fighting the barbarians is, is still important. The emperor technically still gives him orders, but increasingly the emperors are out of touch. One of the problems is the emperors 
don't have good communications around the empire, right? The, the roads are no longer what they used to be. The roads aren't necessarily safe. Uh, you had to have armed units just to send messages now. Um, it, it, the the commun long distance communication was falling apart. The emperors will try to solve this by moving their capital closer to the front, wherever the Germans were. Rome itself no longer functions as the capital of the Roman world. Uh, by the 300s, the capital is at Trier in Germany. The capital is at Ravenna, an island in a swamp in northeast Italy. The capital is at Milan, the big city, Midianum, they called it, in northern Italy. Uh, sometimes, though, that's, you know, sometimes the emperor would just be reigning, such as he did, from a tent and a, and a military camp for months, years at a time. So you can see that the Roman government is slowly falling apart. Um, that means that Roman culture in the West uh, focuses more and more on the life of the mind. Used to be the big political assembly was important. The law courts were important and the like. But the late antique world will be a world where the literate, now remember, only maybe 15% of people could read and write. Only about 15% of the people could read and write. Uh, but if you could, more and more you turn to books. You, there's, there is a lively intellectual world in this period. <laughs> the political world uh, is shrinking. The military world is in chaos. But the wealthy, the people who could read and write, who gotten good educations... Uh, start producing beautiful written works, marvelous books, uh, first-rate philosophy. Um, really a striking contrast. The world outside is falling to pieces. People turn in, inward. Part of this, too, will be the influence of Christianity. Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire uh, in the late 300s. The bishops will foster schools uh, eventually in their communities. And so Christian theology will also become a very rich topic in the 300s and 400s. Uh, we'll have a lecture on that in a little bit. But that's a little sample of what Roman culture is like in the late antique period. Talk to you again soon. Bye.